A chat about commentaries, a lecture that C. H. Spurgeon gave to his students. In order to be able to expound the scriptures, and as an aid to your pulpit studies, you will need to be familiar with the commentators. A glorious army, let me tell you, whose acquaintance will be your delight and profit. Of course, you are not such wise acres as to think or say that you can expound Scripture without assistance from the works of divines and learned men who have laboured before you in the field of exposition. If you are of that opinion, pray remain so, for you are not worth the trouble of conversion, and like a little coterie who think with you, would resent the attempt as an insult to your infallibility. It seems odd that certain men who talk so much of what the Holy Spirit reveals to themselves should think so little of what he has revealed to others. My chat this afternoon is not for these great originals, but for you, who are content to learn of holy men, taught of God, and mighty in the Scriptures. It has been the fashion of late years to speak against the use of commentaries, if there were any fear that the expositions of Matthew Henry, Gill, Scott and others would be exalted into Christian targums, we would join the chorus of objectors. But the existence or approach of such a danger we do not suspect. The temptations of our times lie rather in empty pretensions to novelty of sentiment than in a slavish following of accepted guides. A respectable acquaintance with the opinions of the giants of the past might have saved many an erratic thinker from wild interpretations and outrageous inferences. Usually we have found the despisers of commentaries to be men who have no sort of acquaintance with them. In their case, it is the opposite of familiarity which has bred contempt. It is true there are a number of expositions of the whole Bible, which are hardly worth shelf-room. They aim at too much and fail altogether. The authors have spread a little learning over a vast surface and have badly attempted for the entire scriptures what they might have accomplished for one book with tolerable success. But who will deny the preeminent value of such expositions as those of Calvin, Ness, Henry, Trapp, Poole and Bengal which are as deep as they are broad. And yet further, who can pretend to biblical learning who has not made himself familiar with the great writers who spent a life in explaining some one sacred book? Carol on Job will not exhaust the patience of a student who loves every letter of the word. Even Collinges, with his 909 pages upon one chapter of the Song of Solomon, will not be too full for the preacher's use, nor will Manton's long-metre edition of the 119th Psalm be too profuse. No stranger could imagine the vast amount of real learning to be found in old commentaries like the following, Durham on Solomon's Song, Wilcox on Psalms and Proverbs, German on Ecclesiastes and Proverbs, Greenhill on Ezekiel, Burroughs on Hosea, Ainsworth on the Pentateuch, King on Jonah, Hutchison on John, Peter Martyr on Romans, and so on. And in Willet, Sibs, Bain, Elton, Byfield, Dale, Adams, Taylor, Barlow, Goodwin, and others on the various epistles. Without attempting to give in detail the names of all, I intend in a familiar talk to mention the more notable, who wrote upon the whole Bible, or on either testament, and I especially direct your attention to the titles, which in Puritan writers generally give in brief the run of the work. First among the mighty for general usefulness, we are bound to mention the man whose name is a household word, Matthew Henry. He is most pious and pithy, sound and sensible, suggestive and sober, terse and trustworthy. You will find him to be glittering with metaphors, rich in analogies, overflowing with illustrations, superabundant in reflections. 
He delights in apposition and alliteration. He is usually plain, quaint, and to the point. He sees right through a text directly. Apparently he is not critical, but he quietly gives the result of an accurate critical knowledge of the original, fully up to the best critics of his time. He is not versed in the manners and customs of the East, for the Holy Land was not so accessible as in our day. But he is deeply spiritual, heavenly, and profitable, finding good matter in every text, and from all deducing most practical and judicious lessons. His is a kind of commentary to be placed where I saw it, in the old meeting-house at Chester, chained in the vestry for everybody and anybody to read. It is the poor man's commentary, the old Christian's companion, suitable to everybody, instructive to all. His own account of how he was led to write his exposition affords us an example of delighting in the law of the Lord. What follows are his words. If any desire to know how so mean and obscure a person as I am, who in learning, judgment, felicity of expression, and all advantages for such a service, am less than the least of all my master's servants, came to venture upon so great a work, I can give no other account of it but this. It has long been my practice, what little time I had to spare in my study from my constant preparations for the pulpit, to spend it in drawing up expositions upon some parts of the New Testament, not so much for my own use as purely for my own entertainment, because I know not how to employ my thoughts and time more to my satisfaction. Trahit sua quemque voluptas. Every man that studies hath some beloved study, which is his delight above any other. And this is mine. It is that learning which it was my happiness from a child to be trained up in by my ever-honoured father, whose memory must always be very dear and precious to me. He often minded me that a good textury is a good divine, and that I should read other books with this in my eye, that I might be the better able to understand and apply the scripture. There ends the quotation. You are aware, perhaps, that the latter part of the New Testament was completed by other hands, the good man having gone the way of all flesh. The writers were Messrs. Evans, Brown, Mayo, Bayes, Rosewell, Harris, Atkinson, Smith, Tong, Wright, Merrill, Hill, Reynolds, and Billingsley, all dissenting ministers. They have executed their work exceedingly well, have worked in much of the matter which Henry had collected, and have done their best to follow his methods. But their combined production is far inferior to Matthew Henry himself, and any reader will soon detect the difference. Every minister ought to read Matthew Henry entirely and carefully through, once at least. I should recommend you to get through it in the next twelve months after you leave the college. Begin at the beginning and resolve that you will traverse the goodly land from Dan to Beersheba. You will acquire a vast store of sermons if you read with your notebook close at hand, and as for thoughts, they will swarm around you like twittering swallows around an old gable towards the close of autumn. If you publicly expound the chapter you have just been reading, your people will wonder at the novelty of your remarks and the depth of your thoughts and then you may tell them what a treasure Henry is. Mr. J's sermons bear indubitable evidence of his having studied Matthew Henry almost daily. Many of the quaint things in J's sermons are either directly traceable to Matthew Henry or to his familiarity with that writer. I have thought that the style of J was founded upon Matthew Henry. Matthew Henry is J writing. J is Matthew Henry preaching. What more could I say in commendation either of the preacher or the author? It would not be possible for me to too earnestly press upon you the importance of reading the expositions of that prince among men, John Calvin. I am afraid that scant purses may debar you from their purchase, but if it be possible, procure them 
and meanwhile, since they are in the college library, use them diligently. I have often felt inclined to cry out with Father Simon, a Roman Catholic, Calvin possessed a sublime genius, and with Scaliger, oh, how well has Calvin reached the meaning of the prophets, no one better. You will find forty-two or more goodly volumes worth their weight in gold. Of all commentators, I believe John Calvin to be the most candid. In his expositions, he is not always what moderns would call Calvinistic. That is to say, where Scripture maintains the doctrine of predestination and grace, he flinches in no degree. But inasmuch as some Scriptures bear the impress of human free action and responsibility, he does not shun to expound their meaning in all fairness and integrity. He was no trimmer and pruner of texts. He gave their meaning as far as he knew it. His honest intention was to translate the Hebrew and the Greek originals as accurately as he possibly could, and then to give the meaning which would naturally be conveyed by such Greek and Hebrew words. He laboured, in fact, to declare not his own mind upon the Spirit's words, but the mind of the Spirit, as couched in those words. Dr. King very truly says of him, No writer ever dealt more fairly and honestly by the word of God. He is scrupulously careful to let it speak for itself, and to guard against every tendency of his own mind, to put upon it a questionable meaning for the sake of establishing some doctrine, which he feels to be important, or some theory which he is anxious to uphold. This is one of his prime excellences. He will not maintain any doctrine, however orthodox and essential, by a text of Scripture which to him appears of doubtful application or of inadequate force. For instance, firmly as he believed the doctrine of the Trinity, he refuses to derive an argument in its favour from the plural form of the name of God in the first chapter of Genesis. It were easy to multiply examples of this kind, which, whether we agree in his conclusion or not, cannot fail to produce the conviction that he is at least an honest commentator, and will not make any passage of Scripture speak more or less than according to his view its divine author intended it to speak. The edition of John Calvin's works, which was issued by the Calvin Translation Society, is greatly enriched by the remarks of the editors, consisting not merely of notes on the Latin of Calvin and the French translation, or on the text of the original scriptures, but also of weighty opinions of eminent critics, illustrative manners and customs, and observations of travellers. By the way, gentlemen, what a pity it is that people do not, as a rule, read the notes in the old Puritan books. If you purchase old copies of such writers as Brooks, you will find that the notes in the margin are almost as rich as the books themselves. They are dust of gold, of the same metal as the ingots in the centre of the page. But to return to Calvin, if you needed any confirmatory evidence as to the value of his writings, I might summon a cloud of witnesses, but it will suffice to quote one or two. Here is the opinion of one who is looked upon as his great enemy, namely Arminius. He says, Next to the perusal of the scriptures, which I earnestly inculcate, I exhort my pupils to peruse Calvin's commentaries, which I extol in loftier terms than Helmick himself, for I affirm that he excels beyond comparison in the interpretations of scripture, and that his commentaries ought to be more highly valued than all that is handed down to us by the library of the fathers, so that I acknowledge him to have possessed above most others, or rather above all other men, what may be called an eminent gift of prophecy. Quaint Robert Robinson said of him, There is no abridging of this sententious commentator, and the more I read him, the more does he become a favourite expositor with me. Holy Baxter wrote, I know no man since the Apostles' days, whom I value and honour more than Calvin, and whose judgment in all things, one with another, I more esteem and come nearer to. If you are well enough versed in Latin, 
you will find in Poole's synopsis a marvellous collection of all the wisdom and folly of the critics. It is a large cyclopedia, worthy of the days when theologians could be cyclopean, and had not shrunk from folios to octavos. Query, a query for which I will not demand an answer. Has one of you ever beaten the dust from the venerable copy of Poole which loads our library shelves? Yet as Poole spent no less than ten years in compiling it, it should be worthy of your frequent notice. Ten years, let me add, spent in Amsterdam, in exile for the truth's sake, from his native land. His work was based upon an earlier compilation, entitled Crinici Sacri, containing the concentrated light of a constellation of learned men, who have never been excelled in any age or country. Matthew Poole also wrote annotations upon the Word of God, in English, which are mentioned by Matthew Henry as having passed through many impressions in his day. And he not only highly praises them, but declares that he has in his own work all along been brief upon that which Mr. Poole has more largely discussed, and has industriously declined what is to be found there. The three volumes, tolerably cheap and easily to be got at, are necessaries for your libraries. On the whole, if I must have only one commentary, and had read Matthew Henry as I have, I do not know but that I should choose Poole. He is a very prudent and judicious commentator, and one of the few who could honestly say we have not willingly balked any obvious difficulty and have designed a just satisfaction to all our readers, and if any knot remains yet untied, we have told our readers what hath been most probably said for their satisfaction in the untying of it. Poole is not so pithy and witty by far as Matthew Henry, but he is perhaps more accurate, less a commentator and more an expositor. You meet with no ostentation of learning in Matthew Poole, and that for the simple reason that he was so profoundly learned as to be able to give results without a display of his intellectual crockery. A pedant who is forever quoting Ambrose and Jerome, Piscator and Ecolampadius, in order to show what a copious reader he has been, is usually a dealer in small wares, and quotes only what others have quoted before him. But he who can give you the result and outcome of very extensive reading without sounding a trumpet before him is the really learned man. Mind you do not confound the annotations with the synopsis. The English work is not a translation of the Latin one, but an entirely distinct performance. Strange to say, like the other great Matthew, he did not live to complete his work beyond Isaiah 58. Other hands united to finish the design. Would it be possible to eulogise too much the incomparably sententious and suggestive folios of John Trapp? Since Mr. Dickinson has rendered them accessible, I trust most of you have bought them. Trapp will be most valuable to men of discernment, to thoughtful men, to men who only want a start in a line of thought and are then able to run alone. Trapp excels in witty stories on the one hand, and learned allusions on the other. You will not thoroughly enjoy him unless you can turn to the original, and yet a mere dunce at classics will prize him. His writings remind me of himself. He was a pastor, hence his holy practical remarks. He was the head of a public school, and everywhere we see his profound scholarship. He was for some time amid the guns and drums of a parliamentary garrison, and he gossips and tells strange anecdotes, like a man used to a soldier's life. Yet with all, he comments as if he had been nothing else but a commentator all his days. Some of his remarks are far-fetched, and like the far-fetched rarities of Solomon's Tarshish, there is much gold and silver, but there are also apes and peacocks, his criticisms, would some of them be the cause of amusement in these days of greater scholarship? But for all that, he who shall excel Trap had need rise very early in the morning. Trap is my special companion and treasure. 
I can read him when I'm too weary for anything else. Trap is salt, pepper, mustard, vinegar, and all the other condiments. Put him on the table when you study, and when you have your dish ready, use him by way of spicing the whole thing. Yes, gentlemen, read Trap certainly, and if you catch the infection of his consecrated humour, so much the better for your hearers. A very distinguished place is due to Dr. Gill. Beyond all controversy, Gill was one of the most able Hebraists of his day, and in other matters no mean proficient. When an opponent in controversy had ventured to call him a botcher in divinity, the good doctor, being compelled to become a fool in glorying, gave such a list of his attainments as must have covered his accuser with confusion. His great work on the Holy Scriptures is greatly prized at the present day by the best authorities, which is conclusive evidence of its value, since the set of the current of theological thought is quite contrary to that of Dr. Gill. No one in these days is likely to be censured for his Arminianism, but most modern divines affect to sneer at anything a little too highly Calvinistic, However, amid the decadence of his own rigid system and the disrepute of even more moderate Calvinism, Gill's laurels as an expositor are still green. His altruism is discarded, but his learning is respected. The world and church take leave to question his dogmatism, but they both bow before his erudition. Probably no man since Gill's days has it all equalled him in the matter of rabbinical learning. Say what you will about that law, it has its value. Of course a man has to rake among perfect dunghills and dust heaps, but there are a few jewels which the world could not afford to miss. Gill was a master cinder sifter among the Targums, the Talmuds, the Mishnah and the Gemara. Richly did he deserve the degree of which he said, I never bought it, nor thought it, nor sought it. He was always at work. It is difficult to say when he slept, for he wrote ten thousand folio pages of theology. The portrait of him which belongs to this church, and hangs in my private vestry, and from which all the published portraits have been engraved, represents him after an interview with an Arminian gentleman turning up his nose in a most expressive manner, as if he could not endure even the smell of free will. In some such a vein he wrote his commentary. He hunts Arminianism throughout the whole of it. He is far from being so interesting and readable as Matthew Henry. He delivered his comments to his people from Sabbath to Sabbath, hence their peculiar mannerism. His frequent method of animadversion is this text does not mean this. Nobody ever thought it did. It does not mean that. Only two or three heretics ever imagined it did. And again, it does not mean a third thing, or a fourth, or a fifth, or a sixth absurdity. But at last he thinks it does mean so and so, and tells you so in a methodical, sermon-like manner. This is an easy method, gentlemen, of filling up the time. If you are ever short of heads for a sermon, show your people firstly, secondly, and thirdly what the text does not mean, and then afterwards you can go back and show them what it does mean. It may be thought, however, that one such teacher is enough, and that what was tolerated from a learned doctor would be scouted in a student fresh from college. For good, sound, massive, sober sense in commenting, who can excel Gill? Very seldom does he allow himself to be run away with by imagination, except now and then when he tries to open up a parable and finds a meaning in every circumstance and minute detail, or when he falls upon a text which is not congenial with his creed and hacks and hews terribly to bring the word of God into a more systematic shape. Gill is the Corypheus of hyper-Calvinism, but if his followers never went beyond their master, they would not go very far astray. I have placed next to Gill in my library Adam Clark, 
But as I have no desire to have my rest broken by wars among the authors, I have placed Doddridge between them. If the spirits of the two worthies could descend to the earth, in the same mood in which they departed, no one house would be able to hold them. Adam Clark is the great annotator of our Wesleyan friends, and they have no reason to be ashamed of him, for he takes rank among the chief of expositors. His mind was evidently fascinated by the singularities of learning, and hence his commentary is rather too much of an old curiosity shop. But it is filled with valuable rarities, such as none but a great man could have collected. Like Gill, he is one-sided, only in the opposite direction to our friend the Baptist. The use of the two authors may help to preserve the balance of your judgments. If you consider Clark wanting in unction, do not read him for savour but for criticism, and then you will not be disappointed. The author thought that lengthy reflections were rather for the preacher than the commentator, and hence it was not a part of his plan to write such observations as those which endear Matthew Henry to the millions. If you have a copy of Adam Clarke, and exercise discretion in reading it, you will derive immense advantage from it, for frequently, by a sort of sidelight, he brings out the meaning of the text in an astonishingly novel manner. I do not wonder that Adam Clarke still stands, notwithstanding his peculiarities, a prince among commentators. I do not find him so helpful as Gill, but still from his side of the question, with which I have personally no sympathy, he is an important writer, and deserves to be studied by every reader of the Scriptures. He very judiciously says of Dr. Gill, he was a very learned and good man, but has often lost sight of his better judgment in spiritualizing the text. This is the very verdict which we pass upon himself. Only altering the last sentence a word or two, he has often lost sight of his better judgment in following learned singularities. The monkey, instead of the serpent tempting Eve, is a notable instance. As I am paying no sort of attention to chronological order, I shall now wander back to old Master Mayer, a rare and valuable author. I have been in London a long time now, but I have only of late been able to complete my set. The first volume especially is rare in the extreme. The six volumes, folio, are a most judicious and able digest of commentators, enriched with the author's own notes, forming altogether one of the fullest and best of learned English commentaries, not meant for popular use, but invaluable to the student. He is a link between the modern school, at the head of which I put Poole and Henry, and the older school who mostly wrote in Latin, and were tinctured with the conceits of those schoolmen who gathered like flies around the corpse of Aristotle. He appears to have written before Diodati and Trapp, but lacked opportunity to publish. I fear he will be forgotten, as there is but little prospect of the republication of so diffuse and perhaps heavy an author. He is a very alp of learning, but cold and lacking in spirituality, hence his lack of popularity. In 1653, Arthur Jackson, preacher of God's Word in Wood Street, London, issued four volumes upon the Old Testament, which appear to have been the result of his pulpit expositions to his people. Valuable his works would be if they were no better, but they are not comparable to others already and afterwards mentioned. You can do without him. But he is a reputable author. Far more useful is Ness's History and Mystery of the Old and New Testament, a grand repository of quaint remarks upon the historical books of Scripture, you will find it contained in four thin folio volumes, and you will have a treasure if you procure it. Need I commend Bishop Hall's contemplations to your affectionate attention? What wit! What sound sense! What concealed learning! His style is as pithy and witty as that of Thomas Fuller, and it has a sacred unction about it to which Fuller has no pretension. 
Hark's annotations come to us as the offspring of the famous Synod of Dort, and the Westminster annotations as the production of a still more venerable assembly. But if with my hat off, bowing profoundly to those august conclaves of master minds, I may venture to say so, I would observe that they furnish another instance that committees seldom equal the labours of individuals. The notes are too short and fragmentary to be of any great value. The volumes are a heavy investment. Among entire commentators of modern date, a high place is usually awarded to Thomas Scott, and I shall not dispute his right to it. He is the expositor of evangelical Episcopalians, even as Adam Clark is the prophet of the Wesleyans. But to me, he has seldom given a thought, and I have almost discontinued consulting him. The very first money I ever received for pulpit services in London was invested in Thomas Scott, and I neither regretted the investment nor became exhilarated thereby. His work has always been popular, is very judicious, thoroughly sound and gracious, but for suggestiveness and pith is not comparable to Matthew Henry. I know I am talking heresy, but I cannot help saying that for a minister's use Scott is mere milk and water, good and trustworthy but not solid enough in matter for full-grown men. In the family Scott will hold his place, but in the study you want condensed thought, and this you must look for elsewhere. To all young men of light purses, let me recommend the Tract Society's commentary in six volumes, which contains the marrow of Henry and Scott, with notes from a hundred other authors. It is well executed, and for poor men a great godsend. I believe the Society has some special arrangement for poor students, that they may have these volumes at the cheapest rate. Gentlemen, if you want something full of marrow and fatness, cheering to your own hearts by way of comment, and likely to help you in giving to your hearers much expositions, buy Dr. Hawker's Poor Man's Commentary. Dr. Hawker was the very least of commentators in the matter of criticism. He had no critical capacity, and no ability whatever as an interpreter of the letter. But he sees Jesus, and that is a sacred gift which is most precious, whether the owner be a critic or no. It is to be confessed that he occasionally sees Jesus where Jesus is not legitimately to be seen. He allows his reason to be mastered by his affections, which, vice as it is, is not the worst fault in the world. There is always such a savour of the Lord Jesus Christ in Dr. Hawker that you cannot read him without profit. He has the peculiar idea that Christ is in every psalm, and this often leads him totally astray because he attributes expressions to the Saviour which really shock the holy mind to imagine our Lord's using. However, not as a substantial dish, but as a condiment, place the Plymouth vicar's work on the table. His writing is all sugar, and you will know how to use it, not devouring it in lumps, but using it to flavour other things. Albert Barnes, say you. What do you think of Albert Barnes? Albert Barnes is a learned and able divine, but his productions are unequal in value. The Gospels are of comparatively little worth, but his other comments are extremely useful for Sunday school teachers and persons with a narrow range of reading, endowed with enough good sense to discriminate between good and evil. If a controversial eye had been turned upon Barnes's notes years ago, and his inaccuracies shown up by some unsparing hand, he would never have had the popularity which at one time set rival publishers advertising him in every direction. His Old Testament volumes are to be greatly commended as learned and laborious, and the epistles are useful as a valuable collection of the various opinions of learned men. Placed by the side of the great masters, Barnes is a lesser light. But taking his work for what it is, and professes to be, no minister can afford to be without it, 
and this is no small praise for works which were only intended for Sunday school teachers. Upon the New Testament, Doddridge's Expositor is worthy of a far more extensive reading than is nowadays accorded to it. It is all in the form of a paraphrase, with the text in italics, a mode of treatment far from satisfactory as a rule, but exceedingly well carried out in this instance. The notes are very good, and reveal the thorough scholar. Our authorised version is placed in the margin, and a new translation in the paraphrase. The four evangelists are thrown into a harmony, a plan which has its advantages, but is not without its evils. The practical improvements at the end of each chapter generally consist of pressing exhortations and devout meditations, suggested by the matter under discussion. It is sadly indicative of the Socinianism of the age in which this good man lived that he feels called upon to apologise for the evangelical strain in which he is written. He appears to have barely finished his work in shorthand at the time of his death, and the later books were transcribed under the care of Job Orton. No life insurance society would accept the proposals of a commentator on the whole of either testament, for it seems to be the rule that such students of the word should be taken up to their reward before their task is quite completed. Then, of course, gentlemen, you will economise rigidly until you have accumulated funds to purchase Kitto's pictorial Bible. You mean to take that goodly freight on board before you launch upon the sea of married life. As you cannot visit the Holy Land, it is well for you that there is a work like the Pictorial Bible, in which the notes of the most observant travellers are arranged under the texts which they illustrate. For the geography, zoology, botany and manners and customs of Palestine, this will be your counsellor and guide. Add to this noble comment, which is sold at a surprisingly low price, the eight volumes of Kitto's daily readings. They are not exactly a commentary, but what marvellous expositions you have there. You have reading more interesting than any novel that was ever written, and as instructive as the heaviest theology. The matter is quite attractive and fascinating, and yet so weighty that the man who shall study those eight volumes thoroughly will not fail to read his Bible intelligently and with growing interest. The Nomon of the New Testament by John Albert Bengel is the scholar's delight. He selected the title as modest and appropriate, intending it in the sense of a pointer or indicator like the sundial, his aim being to point out or indicate the full force and meaning of the words and sentences of the New Testament. He endeavours to let the text itself cast its shadow on his page, believing with Luther that the science of theology is nothing else but grammar exercised on the words of the Holy Spirit. The editor of the translation, published by Messrs. Clark, says in his preface, It is quite superfluous to write in praise of the Nomon of Bengal, ever since the year in which it was first published, 1742, up to the present time, it has been growing in estimation, and has been more and more widely circulated among the scholars of all countries. Though modern criticism has furnished many valuable additions to our materials for New Testament exegesis, yet in some respects Bengal stands out still facile princeps, among all who have laboured, or who as yet labour in that important field. He is unrivalled in felicitous brevity, combined with what seldom accompanies that excellence, namely perspicuity, terse, weighty and suggestive. He often, as a modern writer observes, condenses more matter into a line than can be extracted from pages of other writers. In the passages which form the subject of controversy between Calvinists and Arminians, Bengal takes the view adopted by the latter, and in this respect I do not concur with him. But whilst he thus gives an undue prominence, as it would seem to me, to the responsibility and freedom of man in these passages, yet in the general tenor of his work, 
there breathe such a holy reverence for God's sovereignty and such spiritual unction that the most extreme Calvinist would, for the most part, be unable to discover to what section of opinion he attached himself, and as to the controverted passages, would feel inclined to say, Quum talis sis, utinum noster esses. Men with a dislike for thinking had better not purchase the five precious volumes, for they will be of little use to them. But men who love brain work will find fine exercise in spelling out the deep meaning of Bengal's excessively terse sentences. His principles of interpretation, stated in his essay on the right way of handling divine subjects, are such as will make the lover of God's word feel safe in his hands. Put nothing into the scriptures, but draw everything from them, and suffer nothing to remain hidden that is really in them, he says. Though each inspired writer has his own manner and style, one and the same spirit breathes through all, one grand idea pervades all, he says. Every divine communication carries like the diamond its own light with it, thus showing whence it comes. No touchstone is required to discriminate it. The true commentator will fasten his primary attention on the letter, literal meaning, but never forget that the spirit must equally accompany him. At the same time, we must never devise a more spiritual meaning for Scripture passages than the Holy Spirit intended. The historical matters of Scripture, both narrative and prophecy, constitute, as it were, the bones of its system, whereas the spiritual matters are its muscles, blood vessels and nerves. As the bones are necessary to the human system, so Scripture must have its historical matters. The expositor who nullifies the historical groundwork of Scripture for the sake of finding only spiritual truths everywhere brings death on all correct interpretations. Those expositions are the safest which keep closest to the text, he says. Bengal's idea of the true mode of dying touched me much when I first saw it. He declared that he would make no spiritual parade of his last hours, but if possible, continue in his usual works and depart this life as a person in the midst of business leaves the room to attend to a knock at the door. Accordingly, he was occupied with the correction of his proof sheets, as at other times, and the last messenger summoned him to his rest while his hands were full. This reveals a calm, well-balanced mind and unveils many of those singular characteristics which enabled him to become the laborious examiner of the various manuscripts and the pioneer of true biblical criticism. The Critical English Testament A critical testament so compiled as to enable a reader unacquainted with Greek to ascertain the exact English force and meaning of the language of the New Testament and to appreciate the latest results of modern criticism. Such is the professed aim of this commentary, and the compilers have very fairly carried out their intentions. The whole of Bengal's nomon is bodily transferred into the work, and as 120 years have elapsed since the first issue of that book, it may be supposed that much has since been added to the wealth of scripture exposition. The substance of this has been incorporated in brackets, so as to bring it down to the present advanced state of knowledge. We strongly advise the purchase of this book, as it is multum in parvo, and will well repay an attentive perusal. Tichendorf and Alford have contributed largely, with other German and English critics, to make this one of the most lucid and concise commentaries on the text and teachings of the New Testament. Alford's Greek Testament, for the use of theological students and ministers, is an invaluable aid to the critical study of the text of the New Testament. You will find in it the ripened results of a matured scholarship, the harvesting of a judgment, generally highly impartial, always worthy of respect, which is gleaned from the most important fields of biblical research, both modern and ancient, at home and abroad. You will not look here for any spirituality of thought or tenderness of feeling, 
you will find the learned dean does not forget to do full justice to his own views, and is quite able to express himself vigorously against his opponents. But for what it professes to be, it is an exceedingly able and successful work. The latter issues are by far the most desirable, as the author has considerably revised the work in the fourth edition. What I have said of his Greek Testament applies equally to Alfred's New Testament for English readers, which is also a standard work. I must confess also a very tender side towards Bloomfield's Greek Testament, and I am singular enough to prefer it in some respects to Alfred. At least I have got more out of it on some passages, and I think it does not deserve to be regarded as superseded. The commentary by Patrick, Loth, Arnold, Whitby and Lohman is said by Darling to be of standard authority, but you may do without it with less loss than in the case of several others I have mentioned. The authors were men of great learning, their association in one commentary is remarkable, and their joint production has a place in all complete libraries. Dr. Wordsworth's Holy Bible with Notes and Introductions is a valuable addition to our stores, but it is rendered much more bulky and expensive than it needed to be by the printing of the text at large. It gives many precious hints and much of the choicest thought of medieval writers, besides suggesting catchwords and showing connections between various passages, although it is occasionally marred by the characteristic weaknesses of the bishop, and has here and there foolishness, at which one cannot but smile. It is a great work, such as only an eminent scholar could have produced. I am not so enamoured of the German writers, as certain of my brethren appear to be, for they are generally cold and hard and unspiritual. As Dr. Graham says, there are about twenty or thirty names in the literary world who have gained a conspicuous place in theological circles, and in German commentaries these are perpetually introduced. In some of them the bulk of the work is made up of these authoritative names and quotations from their works. This gives their writings the appearance of prodigious learning and research. Every page is bristling with hard words and strange languages, and the eye of the common reader is terrified at the very appearance, as the peaceful citizen is at the pointed cannon of a fortress. There ends Graham's quote. I do, however, greatly prize the series lately produced under the presidency of Dr. Lang. These volumes are not all of equal value, but as a whole they are a grand addition to our stores. The American translators have added considerably to the German work, and in some cases these editions are more valuable than the original matter. For homiletical purposes these volumes are so many hills of gold. But alas, there is dross also, for baptismal regeneration and other grave errors occur. The speaker's commentary has been issued as far as the Lamentations. It is costly too costly for your pockets, and I am therefore somewhat the less sorry to add that it is not what I hoped it would be. Of course it is a great work, and contains much which tends to illustrate the text. But if you had it, you would not turn to it for spiritual food, or for fruitful suggestion, or if you did so, you would be disappointed. The object of the work is to help the general reader to know what the scriptures really say and mean and to remove some of the difficulties. It keeps to its design and, in a measure, accomplishes it. I must also add to the list a commentary, critical, experimental and practical, on the Old and New Testaments. Of this I have a very high opinion. It is the joint work of Dr. Jamieson, A. R. Fawcett and Dr. David Brown. It is to some extent a compilation and condensation of other men's thoughts, but it is sufficiently original to claim a place in every minister's library. Indeed, it contains so great a variety of information that if a man had no other exposition, he would find himself at no great loss if he possessed this, and used it diligently. Several other works I omit, not because they are worthless or unknown to me, 
but because for scant purses the best will be best. I must not omit upon the New Testament the goodly volume of Burkitt. If you can get him cheap, buy him. He is the celebrated rector, whom Keach rectified in the matter of infant baptism. Burkitt is somewhat pithy, and for a modern rather rich and racy, but he is far from deep, and is frequently commonplace. I liked him well enough till I had read abler works and grown older. Some books grow upon us as we read and re-read them, but Burkitt does not. Yet so far from depreciating the good man, I should be sorry to have missed his acquaintance, and would bespeak for him your attentive perusal. The best commentators, after all, are those who have written upon only one book. Few men can comment eminently well upon the whole Bible. There are sure to be some weak points in colossal works. Prolixity in so vast an undertaking is natural, and dullness follows at its heels. But a life devoted to one of the inspired volumes of our priceless Bible must surely yield a noble result. If I find myself able to do so at some future time, I will introduce you to a selection of the great one-book writers. For the present, this much must suffice. 